Okay. Hi, everyone. It's Mark here. I'm the founder of the Arts and Culture Network. We're a growing global community of over 120,000 across our eight LinkedIn groups. And I host a series of networking events on Zoom for the, for the community, and they're becoming increasingly popular. So do check all of that out on the website. But this is the best fun of the job for me. This is where I get to introduce you to one of our full members. Um, so I'm delighted that Maxim has joined me today. Maxim, thank you so much for jumping on to do this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to to get started and, and hear about this stuff. So Yeah, I should point out to our, our viewers and listeners that uh, Maxim has had very little warning about what's coming up. So it is all improvised, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, but before we do that, Maxim, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about you um, and the Creativity Conference and the work that you do in, in public speaking um, so that we have the context for your, your fantasy cultural year that's coming up. My goodness. Well, uh, the the Crip Notes version is uh, when I was a kid, my dad used to say, say yes first and find out how later. And so I've spent a lifetime saying yes to things. Uh, he forgot to mention that I would not get very much sleep uh, by saying yes to things so much. So the summary now is uh, I, I'm a film director. I've directed 35 short films, two feature films. I have a slate of feature films uh, in the works. Sometimes I'm an actor. Naturally, like every British man, I'm waiting for the role of James Bond. Uh, and uh, I'm known in the media technology industry because I write the official book on Adobe's editing software, Premiere Pro, and also the official book on Adobe Audition, their audio software. I recorded 2,300 tutorials on post-production in one form or another. And I uh, founded the Creativity Conference. And the Creativity Conference is really a departure from, uh, you know, I've been doing keynotes for over 20 years, traveling around the world, speaking about either very, very dense technology. I, I presented one a few days ago in Las Vegas on how binary works and how it's used to create numbers and colors. And we use it for uh, telling stories visually uh, or it's pure creativity. And what's special about the creativity conference essentially is the brief for our speakers. We have incredible world-class speakers joining us um, from around the world. And the brief is not to talk about techniques, technology, workflows, business skills, branding, legal issues, business development, anything at all like that. Instead, we ask our speakers to speak about their joy and what it is that inspires them so profoundly that they have no choice but to create something that never existed before. And then we ask the speakers to share their wisdom. We ask them to share practical, actionable, specific advice. And part of the inspiration for this was um, an interview I read with Richard Bach, who wrote my favorite book, Illusions, where he said he hated writing Jonathan Livingston Seagull. He swore he would never write another book. But then the second book idea he had would throw him from his bed and demand to be written. He described it as tearing the ceiling and the walls from his bedroom and shaking him awake and demanding to be written. And I love this idea of a different relationship with our muse. Instead of hoping it will inspire us, the muse shakes us vigorously and says, you must take this idea. This is really lovely. So I do that. I just wrote my first philosophy book. That's uh, due for publication. I'm going to be I'm talking to publishers now. It's a practical philosophy book. Uh, I used to teach Tai Chi. Um, I don't sleep enough. I'm uh, a great advocate for sleep deprivation and coffee. <laughs> Your father was right. You won't get to sleep much if you keep saying yes. Um, <clears throat> it's really interesting because I've my I've been through periods in my life where I've I've felt like I've been put you know spread too thinly over different ideas. There's there's probably eight businesses still to start um, and ideas. Uh, but there's a lovely line in the Otis Redding song um, that really resonated with me when he gets a little bit overheated halfway through in the middle eight. He says, um, I can't do what 10 people tell me to do. Um, and um, so I've done the I've gone the opposite direction over the last year, I guess. I've 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 found a focus um, so that I'm not spreading myself too thinly. I um I often think that my email inbox is other people's to-do list for me um, and with their, own, with their own priorities in there. So I now use wherever possible, the Yester box. Have you, are you familiar with the Yester box? No, talk, talk me through the, it. It's the, um, it, it's the 
it's the practice of own of answering first the messages that came in yesterday or before because that box is not going to get any bigger huh. and um then once you've done that you then turn to the things that have come in today um because it starts to dilute other people's priorities for you um so uh, yeah it, it, it's it's fun it's genius it's, it, it's great it does it does work um but um yeah so i'm i'm focused now on um the arts and culture network i i know i i kind of well i had a bit of a health scare a couple of years ago and, and a year and a half ago and realized okay i'm on the back nine now what do i really want to be doing and mm. um my superpower seems to be connecting people and my passion is the arts and culture sector so um as a musician by training and profession so um yeah it's it's the it was the fastest running horse in the in the stable um but i had to stop doing other things to make sure that i wasn't diluting myself too thinly so yeah. um and i'm sliding disgracefully towards semi retirement anyway so um it's it, it works for me so there we go. I, I already i'm already at the age where i travel with slippers now so i feel you <laughs> <laughs> well I, i'm the opposite of you when it comes to sleep i love sleep it's one of my favorite things and um i i can be a, i think my my record is six minutes i know this because i timed myself i can i can be asleep inside six minutes because i set i once set an alarm for seven minutes and it woke me up so um i, I know i can do that and and i'm a bit like churchill and margaret thatcher i need a 4 p.m nap pretty much um, oh, na I, I I love taking naps. I do whenever I can. I love sleep. I just, I don't know, like the, the minutes tick by like seconds sometimes. Yeah. Um, have you tried a nappuccino? Oh, I, now I think I know what that is. That way you have a coffee, then go to sleep. And it and wakes you up. Caffeine kicks in. There's an amazing um, book I read, well, a bit of a book I read years ago about how to be a slacker. And one of the recommendations was, set an alarm 15 minutes before you do to wake up and have a triple espresso with lots of sugar in it next to the bed, cold. Yeah. You wake up with the first alarm, down the triple espresso and go back to sleep again. And 15 minutes later, when the second alarm goes off, there's no way you're going to be able to stay asleep. Oh, that's a great idea. I've got an old 1970s teas made. I could use that. Right. Yeah. That right. Would, that would be good. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, you see, I told you we would digress. Here we go. Right. Here we go. <laughs> So thank you for um, being one of our full members and the great work that, that you're doing around bringing that expertise to people through the, the, the conference. It's great. I know you and I've discussed it in the past, and um, I think there was one occasion where I nearly had the chance to, to contribute, but um, I, I hope we, I'll be able to at some point in the future. The, the chance will come again. We're, we're hosting more conferences and, and we're expanding. So I'd love for you to speak. So that would be we'll great. Find a way. Yeah. I'll have to find. I'll have to figure out the joy, I, the so that I can capture it in the right way. But um, yes. excellent, right? Now we're going to have some fun. Now um, I'm going to create your fantasy cultural year from the answers to ten easy questions. Now uh -huh. there are no wrong answers, um, and um, I hope you enjoy your year. I'm about to send you on. Are you ready? Fantastic. Right. <clears throat> right. So, Maxim, I need to place you in the world somewhere. Um, and I'm going to do that by asking you, what's your favorite building? Wow. Oh my goodness. My f Can I, only one? Only one, I'm afraid. I've got to put you there. Is it a specific building or a type of building? Any building you like, your favorite. It, you may not have been there. It may be a building that you've always loved. So there are some, there are some amazing, I mean, goodness, uh, you know, the Eiffel Tower is incredible. Um, I love the British Museum very much. Uh, there are some spaces around the world, sacred circles, you know, like uh, stone circles, particularly in the British Isles, there's tons of them. Avebury, the stone circle in Avebury is just phenomenal. And there's a great haunted pub next to it, which is which is wonderful, the Red Lion. My, my happy place though, is a cafe. In fact, I call it the five C's. It's a, a cafe with a good company, coffee, uh, great conversation and cake. And so <laughs> I would say any Mediterranean cafe with nice shade and a beautiful day um, with good company, that's absolutely my happy place. Okay. 
Mediterranean. Would you like to be French Riviera or Italian Riviera? Where shall we where shall we place you? Or well, you... my French is better, so I suppose French <laughs> French <laughs> French okay. Riviera or Spain. I mean, there's some beautiful cafes in uh yeah. Mile, you know. So a Spanish, let's say a Spanish cafe is great. A, a Spanish cafe, how about um in front of La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. Take yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. There you are. Okay. okay. In front of the Gaudi Cathedral. Incredible architecture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Um, now I'd like you to picture yourself at that um cafe. Yeah. Uh, it's on the pavement. The sun is streaming down. It's 6 p.m. Yeah. in the afternoon. It's June. Um, you're admiring the view of the uh, cathedral. And mm -hmm. can I have yeah. ice cream? Ice cream's great in Barcelona. You can have ice cream. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you've got you've just finished your ice cream and there is a book on your right. I think mm. I already know what book that book would be. Is it illusions? <sighs> These questions. Mm. It's gonna have to be. Yeah, it would have to be Illusions by Richard Bach. Okay. I set out to uh I read Illusions when I was eleven. And uh it just you know, it set me, it kind of set me on a path of spiritual inquiry. And I set out from there to really try to understand the life, the universe and everything. And, I, and in, that, in the decades since then, I've, I've encountered, I studied every spiritual system I could find, every religious outlook. I tried to understand everyone's uh, understanding of what it means to be. And truth is, I've never found a better philosophy than the one presented in that book. I've studied the works. I mean, I was reading tarot cards at 13, you name it. And uh, dream analysis, psychoanalysis, like everything I could find. I studied Tai Chi, became a Tai Chi master. It's a long story. Um, Reiki, became a Reiki master, shamanism, all of that. And I always come back to the philosophy presented in Illusions. Right. He's that's, a very clever writer. That's now on my book list. Thank you for that. That's great. Now, given that it's 6 p.m. and it's June and it's warm and it's sunny and mm -hmm. the view is great and you're in Barcelona, there is a drink on your left and you can have whatever you like. What well, it's I, I would say it depends on exactly the time of day, but I would say either it would be a cup of coffee. Um, I, I didn't I didn't grow up with my dad around. My parents separated when I was very young and uh, but we would visit him. My brother and I would visit my dad. <clears throat> and as I got older and got to know him better and, and became his friend, uh, he would always have a cup of coffee on the go. And he would tell this story about how there was a cafe when he was a teenager that you could stay in as long as there was still coffee in your cup. <laughs> so they would have one cup of coffee last them six hours. <laughs> they'd be, you know, sipping, sipping, sipping very, very slowly this cup of coffee. So, and if you ever asked him, would you like a coffee? The answer would always be yes. And I think because of, I have a kind of Pavlovian anchor, a Pavlovian association, if you like, with coffee and that love of getting to know my dad when I was a kid. And so I, I grew up really loving coffee. And uh, in fact, I have two cups that he, he died many years ago, but he had this particular type of cup he used to love. Uh, and I have two of them so that on his birthday, I can have a coffee with somebody and reminisce with him. But if it's later in the evening, it would be an espresso martini. Okay. And in fact, uh, many years ago at the um, Berlin Soho house, I invented a martini all, you know, towards me becoming James Bond, obviously, you've got to have a martini. And so it's a, an espresso martini sweetened with St. Germain is a Jago martini. Oh, apparently no. it's on the menu somewhere in san francisco there's a mixologist <laughs> so. i love that i i created a brand as well just briefly um because my background is in music and brand and marketing um i was away on a golfing trip with uh, 15 mates and it went and i decided i needed to lose a stone so i'd started drinking um pints of white wine and soda um because then i could it's a pint you know so yeah. Um, the guys would go up to the bar um, and and say, "We'll have a, we'll have fifteen pints of Stella, please, and a um, and a white wine and soda for the lady." I think they called it Wolf Juice or something. So <laughs> I thought, right, I'm not having that. I'm going to rebrand it. So I started. I said, "Right, boys, from now on, a pint of white wine and soda is called a Butch." 
okay that's great um and so i said ask for it and so i spent the next 10 years asking for a pint of butch everywhere i went yeah um, and i i played with it and i thought well if you did it with rose you could call it a bitch um if you did it with um if you got it wrong and put lemonade in it's a botch <laughs> and and if you if you ordered more than one it's a batch um and i was playing around with it and a few years later a friend of mine who wanted to lose weight and said what's that thing you drink that lost a stone i said it's butch it's half white wine and soda yeah. there's more alcohol in it than cooking lager um yeah. and he said great so he started doing that and uh, he rang me a few few months later and he said i've just been um he said i've got to tell you something um I was in a bar in Brighton, um, which probably not a good idea to ask for a pint of butch in a bar in Brighton. And <laughs> it depends on the bar. Uh, well, it does depend on the bar. But um, so I didn't. I said, I'd like a, a pint of white wine and soda water, half and half. And he said, I kid you not. The guy behind the bar said, do you mean a pint of butch? So fantastic. I, I was, it can work. It, it can, can work. work. I loved it. I, I was it was it was great. I loved it. I still I still drink that rather than beer um but anyway we digressed again anyway so there we are you're sitting at the cafe um with the book and the drinks um yeah. now you're you're rather pleased with yourself because you've just come from a meeting with a wealthy spanish family foundation okay okay and they've asked you if you'd like to do a year-long study of the arts and culture landscape in the country of your choice wow it's very well paid it's first class all the way um they'll even pay for loved ones to come um and visit you and i know exactly who you'd choose <laughs> um, and then the only thing they need to, to know is which country would you like to do this in now it could be you could stay in spain if you wish but most people go elsewhere so given this wonderful opportunity Every, all your personal admins sorted it's it's going to there's there's no reason why you shouldn't go and earn a lot of money and have a lot of fun these Where, questions are not fair mark these are not ah <laughs> uh, oh, that's cruel just one country okay i i think it's going to have to be i want to say japan okay that's a nice I choice. love Japan. I, I'm there again soon. Uh, my sister-in-law is Japanese, and uh, I, I know enough Japanese to ask for coffee, which is uh, important. Um, yes. and, uh, Jap the Japanese culture is so extraordinary, and it's it's such a beautiful mixture of the ancient and the modern, and uh, the society is so complex. I could easily spend a year just immersed in in Japanese culture. Phenomenal. Okay. Well, we're going to do that. So um, you're on the plane um, and the steward hands you a note from the family foundation <laughs> and they asked to wait until you were airborne before you got, read the note. Um, they'd like to study you while you're studying it. Um, and one of the things they'd like to know is the impact on you of reducing of limiting your musical listening to one very specific type of music for 12 months <laughs> i mean it to the exclusion of all else it's got to be classical i mean it, it has to be classical music um, yep. i mean that's cheating a little bit because it's so diverse it is a broad church isn't it yeah. yes you've got everything from palestrina to hans zimmer there it's um, yeah pretty much yeah. yeah i mean it's there's so much there it's so rich yeah okay yeah. classical it is any any composers in particular who you might want on your playlist i had a i had a whole phase of vaughan williams like fantasia on a theme by thomas tallis is mm. phenomenal um avo pet the modern composer some of his stuff is stunning mm. um yeah i think uh vaughan williams is great I love a bit of Brahms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it varies, but that, that theme by Thomas Tallis is pretty spectacular. Yeah. Epic. Um, do you know Spam in Allium as well? I, I, yes, but only very, very little. 
Yeah, it was featured in a movie called Gideon's Daughter with Bill Nye, um, and the choir was singing it. It's something like 32 different parts. Um, mm -hmm. Have a listen. Spem, uh, again, again, I think it's Talis. Spem in Allium. It is. It's, it's in incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very fortunate. I spent 11 years in the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra oh. percussion section, so I got to play some amazing... Marla is my go-to. Um, Phenomenal. Can't... I can't live without the last 10 minutes of Mahler's second symphony. So, um, and um, Interstellar is the only movie I watch for the music. Oh, amazing film. I was watching bits of that yesterday. Um, or Rachmaninoff, you know. Yeah. My father's favorite song was Rachmaninoff's uh, second piano concerto. Yeah. And uh, just From the movie um, where they're on the train. Yeah. Can't remember what it's called, it's gone. Um, mm. Okay, right, so um, you're listening to classical music on the plane and that's it for the year, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll, I'll resolve that for you later. Totally fine, totally yeah. fine. Yeah. So you arrive in Tokyo, um, having turned left when you got on the plane and, and <laughs> slept most of the way. Um, and there's a group of people who've been detailed to welcome you. Um, they're holding your name up at the airport, which I, I'm sure you see a lot of in your international speaking activities. Um, they 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 they're very pleased to see you. They want to they want to they're going to take you to your loft apartment that overlooks some cherry blossom blossom laden palace in the center of Tokyo. You will probably know which one. Um, and they said, please settle in, have a rest. We're going to take you out to a dance performance and then to dinner. Now. The purpose of this fantasy cultural year is that you don't have to stay Japan Japanese in terms of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it works better if you don't. So mm -hmm. I want you to imagine there's a magical theater in which can be staged any dance performance, mm -hmm. any dancers, living or dead, any dance group or any dance style for a two hour show and you get the best seat in the house. So. I, I, I'd be choosing between two, really. Uh, I, I know it's a bit left field, but I just think K-pop is amazing. I directed a K-pop um, live performance show once, and what they do is just incredible. But also, I was speaking, actually, I gave a, um, a keynote in Las Vegas a few days ago, talking about Nijinsky's Rite of Spring, mm -hmm. if you've seen that ballet. It is, you know, if somebody announced today that they've choreographed the Rite of Spring, people would think it was the most mind-blowingly progressive, no one's ever done this before, piece of choreography. It's wild and nothing like any other ballet I've ever seen. And, uh, but I, I'm gonna get this date wrong. I feel like it was, it was choreographed in the 50s or something. It was way back that Rite of Spring was uh, choreographed. Uh, the and first performance was, I think, in 1910. 1910, uh, there you go, 1910. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, unbelievable. I had, I had the Diaghilev, Diaghilev, and the and the and the Bolshoi. Um, I uh -huh. think, yeah, those were the Diaghilev was the kind of impresario who, 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 who brought those two presented together. it. Yeah. yeah, just incredible. So I, it it would, if I had to choose, given that I'm going on the classical music direction, I would go with with that Rite of Spring. Fantastic, love it. There was a riot in Paris when it was first performed. I I, I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's now, for many, it's kind of mainstream. Yeah. Um, I played it many times in the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, and mm. um, it, it's it, it's 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 wonderful. But um, if you roll back over a hundred years, just to try and imagine the impact of that. Um, well, it, I mean, I'm not surprised there were riots. I mean, mm. very intense and strange performance. Yeah. You know, and it was a time where where the concept of perception was not as fluid as it is today. It used to be, you know, this is the time where we started to see film first arriving and they had a film of a train coming towards the camera and people were running out of the theater, convinced they were gonna get hit by a train. And, and I think that that's very interesting because it says a lot about our conscious perception of reality. Mm. This was a flickery black and white rendering of a train 
And it was compelling enough that people genuinely believed a train was coming, even though it was black and white, all of that. Yeah. And so it just goes to show how little information we need to have a genuinely, uh, to have an authentic emotional experience, an emotional reaction to things. Yeah. You can imagine. Yeah. yeah. It's the same. The same. Th uh, I had a conversation about this. I did a talk about this as well, about the future of the symphony orchestra, because 150 years ago, the loudest thing you could hear was a symphony orchestra. Or a, or a cannon, if you were unfortunate enough to be on a yes, to be near one, yeah. A sound alone was enough to bring people to the concert hall. Never yeah. mind the fact that you've got a hundred people looking bored on the stage. The sound alone was was yeah. enough to bring, I think, nineteen thousand people to a tent in San Francisco to hear Yehudi Menuhin. And but now we've got so many alternatives. We've got sound effects. We've got amplification. We've got headphones. We've got yeah. round sound. We've got three hundred sixty degree sound. We've got special yeah. effects games. The, the sad reality 150 years later is that it's it's no longer competing um as an experience mm. and it's becoming kind of nostalgic sort of specialist it's it's over there with blue cheese fine wine and shakespeare you know but um, emotionally i mean you go to a live performance by musicians who really know what they're doing it absolutely sends you away it's oh uh, yeah it's just that it's, it's, it's difficult to drag people to to experience it for the first time because their perception is that um i mean my two of my daughters call it the dorchestra still <laughs> how old are your daughters uh 30 and 28 <laughs> oh goodness i thought you were gonna say 14 or something <laughs> yeah but well, they, each to their own <laughs> yeah absolutely but they but get them in front of it i mean i i used to run a chamber music series in mayfair um at a church in mayfair and um i knew that it, it, it selling chamber music was it was a, a tough because right. only three percent of londoners said they enjoyed it <laughs> so i i sold a drinks reception preceded by some chamber music um and we had yeah. 250 people at the last concert in the church Amazing. we had people city traders ringing up saying i'm afraid i'm gonna miss the music at seven but can i still come for the drinks at eight <laughs> so yeah. it's that old saying isn't it um somebody who buys a quarter inch drill doesn't want a quarter inch drill what they want is a quarter inch hole exactly so you yeah, sell that's how real marketing works you yeah. sell them, not the drill yeah <laughs> in fact a friend of mine took that a bit further and said no they don't even want the hole okay what do they want they want to hang the painting? No, they don't want to hang the painting. Well, what do they want? They want to hang the painting so their spouse stops telling them to. Okay, so they want them. Yes. To, yeah, and it all comes back to happiness or or a, a, or a quieter life. Anyway, yes, they want the sorry, final outcome. Yes, which is happiness. Yeah. Yes. It, yeah. yeah it, all roads lead there. Um, yeah. It would be fun to do a, a blog post about that, <laughs> and and check that check that that's the case. Yeah. Which yeah. what which bit of the narrative is the actual goal? Yes, yes. And for me, that's naps and picnics. I think if the, the ultimate goal is to reach a point where I can have naps and picnics. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, right. Um, where did we get to? Um, have we done sport? Oh. Have we done sport yet? We, no, we did uh, We did what kind of dance? Okay, we've done dance. Oh, dinner then. What, Nash, what cuisine would you like for dinner? <sighs> it's difficult to beat French. Mm. I love... Japanese food but if we're talking really like as good as it gets it's it's probably going to have to be French cuisine okay love that now yeah. the next day in Tokyo is sport day okay and they play a lot of sport they do everything so you yeah. can watch anything but if you had to sit in front of a sporting event which would you choose oh gymnastics okay or martial arts but I think martial arts because i used to teach a martial art um i, I have a, an interest in it i suppose professionally but uh gymnastics performances are just mesmerizing you know it's incredible so i'd, I'd go with gymnastics it's a performance art after all isn't yeah. It? yeah yeah um now there is a new art gallery in tokyo that has um harnessed all all that technology can provide us with to um, immerse you in the work of a of one visual artist you can even put a vr set on and step into one of their paintings and walk mm. around it, inside it um whose work would you like to explore in that way I, do you know it is not fair that you you, you don't give people the questions in advance um, <laughs> so so you know some of um a lot of my work now is i i didn't mention at the beginning i 
I share my time between these creative works and I also consult on future and emerging technologies. So a lot of my keynotes over the last couple of years have been about things like artificial intelligence. In fact, I gave a speech for the United Nations in December about uh, where we're at and where we're headed with artificial intelligence. And that's led to, that speech has led to some changes in the way that the UN uh, integrates AI into their peacekeeping operations, which is wonderful. And I mentioned this because I'm, I'm a big advocate for uh, XR, so VR, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, these virtualization technologies. And um, I suppose, I might, in fact, my next film project will be a true XR film. We're making a feature film that's true 3D rendered so you can walk around the actors and explore it. Wow. Um, artist, I mean, my first thought was Rilke, some of Rilke's uh, paintings are just stunning. And if you could make that into an immersive experience, like a virtual reality experience would be incredible. I've seen some good examples of that with Van Gogh. Um, or, you know, if we're talking broadly about art, um, maybe Spielberg's films, if you could turn Spielberg's films into immersive experiences, or you mentioned Interstellar, you know, imagine an immersive version of Interstellar, or even for that matter, um, most of it's behind closed doors at the moment, but my partner, Samantha Tauber, she is producing the most extraordinary virtual reality layered uh, music and sound uh, experiences. None of it's public yet, but just wait. Oh, uh, I'm looking for simplicity, that. let's say, for simplicity, let's say Rilke. You know, imagine okay. an immersive version of The Kiss. That would be quite something. Let me uh, spell that for me. Rilke, uh, um, hang on, not Rilke. Um, I mean Klimt. Klimt, I mean Klimt. Rilke's the poet. Well, oh, yeah. Rilke, as a, uh, since we were in Spain earlier, uh, yeah. the poetry of Rilke is absolutely stunning. But uh, let's say Klimt, because that would Klimt. be a visual spectacle. Yeah, that would. You can. Um, I once um, knew uh, the daughter of a, an, art, an art collector, Marcus Misner, and he used to um, pay the rent for artists in the early 1900s in return for some of their work, and Klimt was one of them. Wow. And he died in 94. They... Um, they uh, they had to build a new wing at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art to to house the collection. It was Kandinsky, Klimt, Mondrian, Chagall, incredible collection. But yeah, Klimt, wonderful thing. To, you'd be able to step in and walk around. You know, yeah. I think it, I think I'm right that um, I think Tarzan was the first animated feature film in which the camera moved. So. Oh. It, it wow. up until yeah um so the viewport so it would follow tarzan swinging through the yeah. so the system had to know which what was on the back of that tree for the first time because the camera would see it um or the, you know um and it's no longer celluloid in 2d it was yeah. it was that so i'd love to be able to step into st mark's square in a canaletto and yeah. um it'd be animated and yeah um, and it's that's going to come and it's and it's going to be great I, I very soon well the the technology to do that exists already in fact if you it's not quite the same but if you check out um google earth mm. or google maps and if you have a vr headset there's google earth vr and it is unbelievably compelling because buildings are all in 3d yeah you can physically walk down a street anywhere that they've got the models so yes. i went to Piazza de San Marco to explore it in Venice. And it was quite emotional. You know, I visited Venice many times and, but there, you know, there's the tower and the, you know, the- And you're the, looking around like this. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's right there. It's it's very moving as an experience. It gives you a different perspective on the world. That sounds great. Is that stereoscopic or do you need a proper yeah. headset for that? Well, uh, you, you would need a VR headset to really have the experience. You could do it with yeah. a phone, but- uh, or any or any other device that supports it, but yeah. um, having a VR headset makes it amazing. Yeah, and that's what's going to happen with my next film project. We're building the entire environment in such a way that you can just ignore the dialogue and go off and explore the explore the environment if you want to. Oh, wow, so wow. it's fully, truly immersive and wow. photorealistic. So fantastic! That sounds great. Um, excellent. So to continue your immersive week, right? So we've had uh, what did we have? Visual art now. I'm going to give you the option, one of four options for the next night's entertainment. A pop concert or rock concert, a play, a musical 
or an opera? I'd probably go for the play. Okay. Like a really good one, right? Really well performed. Yeah. You can choose one if you wish. No particular one I'd, I'd have in mind, but um, I don't think they're around anymore. The um, There was a theatre group called Théâtre de Compliqué. They were absolutely amazing. Really used uh, the environment and the costumes in extraordinary ways. And they would put on Shakespeare. Um, back in my days of learning to act, uh, I would put on things like Midsummer Night's Dream is probably my favourite play. Mm. Oh, a Winter's Tale is phenomenal. Um, they're very good, but uh, but I think even a modern play that's really well performed. Okay, that's good. Great. Do yeah. please check uh, chase up Roger Hartley. Roger he, Hartley. Yeah, I think you and he would have a fascinating conversation. Um, to give you an indication of how crazy he can be, his pronoun is that. <laughs> um, right. And he's the uh, director of the Bureau of si the Bureau of Silly Ideas. Um, Brilliant. They did a they did a spoof campaign once, um, which um, they they create scandalous scenarios in real life and allow the public to ang get angry about them, and then they make it worse. So they came up with this that the I think it might have been near Brighton, the the the, the redevelopment of a school had overrun horribly, and the council needed to distract people from that. <laughs> so they they hired the Bureau of Silly Ideas to discover. Um, a, a, a well a sink well beneath the school which uh -huh. connections to the sea right which for some reason was where squid liked to congregate okay um so they'd swim up from there and they'd end up in this sinkhole under the school and they and they, so the council were claiming they didn't know what they should do because with all these squid um and so they created a new company called squid ink inc literally um and they had a website it had it, it had everything it needed to feel real um and they they were the company was what they did was they extracted squid ink which is quite valuable from the squid yeah. right? right um and they wrote this article for the newspaper saying that they'd found that the best thing to get squid to eject their ink was um being frightened by dogs so they put a call out for local families to bring their dogs and they said we'll put your dog in a cage down by the the sink hole and we'll prod your dog with a stick and it will bark and the the, the squid will eject their ink and, <laughs> and they were on the telly they would it's like dadaism oh it was it was an absolute work of art because people fell for it hook like a line and sinker there were protests about you can't prod dogs you know you so yeah. they, they then issued an apology um while this time the council were catching up on them sort of oh, out yeah. of the school. So yeah. it was a perfect distraction. They Amazing. put out a second press release saying that they apologized profusely for upsetting animal lovers. But what they found is that young children screaming is an awful lot better. <laughs> so <laughs> so now like, like, children with a stick. <laughs> yes, like monsters ink. <laughs> and they're uh, th but they never admit to it, they just let it run. Um, it's it's very funny stuff. Um, it reminds me of the. Uh, I think Dadaism is probably my favourite uh, approach to art. And one of my uh, there's a beautiful video you can find it on YouTube somewhere, where they filmed people running down the street, but in slow motion, and they had wires in their scarves to make it look like the wind was catching them, and they're running it. at this incredibly slow pace. And there's yeah. a cart, they're pulling a cart with people sitting on it and they're all doing this slow motion. But you can see the passers-by, they're all like, what's yeah. going on? And they're all at normal speed. So it's the first slow motion effect, but it was literally slow motion. And one of my yeah. other favorites is that somebody made their art was eating spiders and swearing at priests. <laughs> you, you reminded me as well of like, my father was a playwright and a, and a director for theater, uh, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Hobbins. And he... Uh, they, they had a, a play that they put on that wasn't getting great turnout for the audience. And during the play, there's, there's one moment where a, a woman with her back to the audience, she's wearing a towel and she flashes somebody on stage. She opens her towel 
but she got it back to the audience. So nobody sees anything of any, she's wearing a swimming costume, right? But nobody can see that. And then the characters react on stage. So they all think she's naked under the towel. And they got terrible turnout. So my dad <laughs> phoned up the local newspaper and said, I want to tell you this anonymously. I'm not giving you my name, but last night I went to see this play and I have never in my life witnessed such an obscene representation of depravity, nudity, sex. I'm absolutely disgusted. My wife couldn't sleep. We were horrified by the depraved, uh, um, you know, performance that went on at this theater. And I just think the people need to know how disgusting it is and left them to it. And then the newspaper published this article and they had sellout performances for the rest of the run. Everybody, everybody wanted to see if they could withstand the depravity. And of course it was just a situation comedy. The whole thing was just a light comedy play. Oh, that's great, isn't it? I love, I love stories like that. Um, the other company that I discovered and loved is the Natural Theatre Company. Um, I don't know if you've heard about them, but one of the thing, one of the stunts they did was at Covent Garden in the summer. They had twenty people carrying pink suitcases um, with Velcro on the ends, and over the over the course of about an hour, they all joined up. So they were walking at random around Covent Garden, and then two would meet up, and the Velcro would catch, and they would, they ended up as a, a, a snake of twenty pink. Oh, that's brilliant. Suitcases. It's just it's, it's lovely, really good um excellent right we've got to finish our year so what, what did we have there what was that that was, that was uh, the oh yes yeah, theater or, or music yeah. or yeah so movie next um oh. your japanese friends want you to decide on a movie that you love that you think they'll also love that might not see you how about that one you're asking a film director what his favorite film is aren't you yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> So for years, I used to say that I didn't like individual films. I liked moments in films. Mm. And there are some films that, you know, filmmakers tend to love. Um, Wings of Desire, Ben Bender's amazing. Blade Runner, Leon, uh, they call that the professional in America. Um, Jean mm. Reno, um, made Natalie Portman famous, phenomenal yeah. film. I loved it. I've seen, I watched it again a couple of months ago. I loved it. It's yeah. just, it's... It's, you know, sometimes I watch films and as a filmmaker, I think, how could I ever hope to achieve that as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. right? Like how, how did they even do that? How did they achieve that? But I think if I were to pick one film, there's a, there's a more recent film, a Luc Besson film called um, Angela, or it's Angel, uh, Angel A. And uh, I think at the moment, that is my favorite film in the world. Right. And it's about a guy, I always forget the actor's name. I think he's Moroccan, French Moroccan. He has, um, the actor has a, uh, I think he has a deformed hand. So he tends to play, well, he's a good actor. He has his, tends to play with, with a hand in his pocket. And he plays up to that in the film. And it starts out with him. He's a sort of failed businessman, owes people money in Paris. It's a black and white film, although it's fairly modern. And he decides to kill himself by jumping off a bridge into the Seine. But before he can do it, this extraordinarily beautiful, angelic looking uh, woman jumps first. And so instead of jumping to kill himself, he has to jump in to save her life. Wow. This that is all is the, the trailer, this is all the setup for the film. And she says, well, you've saved my life. You are now fully responsible for it. And I will do anything you tell me to do. And he's, there's this wonderful dialogue between the two of them. And he's, he's a relatively short, um, not unattractive man, but he's not a model. And she's this towering above him, you know, um, pale skin, blonde hair. I forget the name. It was a model that they hired for the role. They put her in a heel, so she's towering above him. And he says something like, well, oh, well, anything? She says, anything at all. He says, okay, I don't believe you. Kiss me. So she gives him this passionate kiss, this completely devotional, loving kiss. And he's like, Okay, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and then they begin this journey together. And it's a it's a story about self-acceptance and realism. So having having founded the Creativity Conference, I've been interviewed a lot to talk about what I think creativity is. And it's a question we ask our speakers a lot. And my definition for creativity is any intentional decision. Anything at all. Could be raising a child, painting a picture, founding a company, anything. 
that's intentional because that way you're shaping the future. You're part, you're actively participating in life. Not You're not having life happen to you. You are happening to life and you're changing the future. Might not get what you expect, but you're engaged in the, the threading of the, of the, of the, the cords that make the tapestry of life. Mm. And so in order for you to make intentional decisions, you have to embrace what is real. And to do that, you have to see yourself without judgment because if you judge yourself, you just see the judgment. So this film is sort of exploring those ideas. And I believe all Luke Besson films come down to one shot. Interestingly with Leon, it's a shot that was cut from the theatrical release of the film. You have to see the director's cut of Leon to see the one shot that I think the entire film is about. I won't ruin it for you. See if you can spot it. The director's cut okay. is much better. Okay. But in, you will know it in uh, Angel A, in Angela. There's one, it's just brilliant. There's one piece of dialogue that leads up to one shot. And uh, I won't describe it, leave it for you to, to okay. discover. But you, gonna... it's an internal change in you when you have that moment in the film. And so mm -hmm. for me, the, the difference between small A art and capital A art is that small A art is, might be pleasant to experience, but you're left unchanged by it. Mm -hmm. And capital A art changes the person who experiences it. Mm -hmm. And I think that Besson sets out to do that with his films. I once wrote a quote of, of a photographer's portrait work. Um, I think I said, um, a good portrait tells you something about the subject. A great portrait tells you something about yourself. Yes. Um, and so I get that. I'm going to watch and uh, re-watch. Right, we've got to finish our week. Okay. Um, two more things. Um, the first is that you're going to have Hero Day in Tokyo. Hero Day is where we book a restaurant for you for two hours. You can choose three guests, anyone you like, living or dead. <laughs> <laughs> mm. This is not fair. Um, <clears throat> three people, three people. Okay. Uh, you know, since we were talking about him already, I'd love for my dad to be there. My dad died before I matured into who I became, if I can say it that way. He never knew me uh, as the man I am. And I just wish he could have lived long enough. I just wish, because I was, you know, we're all winging it, we're all making our way. Nobody knows what they're doing really. Nobody knows what they're doing. We're just trying to stay out of trouble and have, have a good time. And I was definitely at an age where I was winging it when he died. And I just wish he, that we could have met now. So it's one of those turning points, I think, as you get older, you live through the age that your parents were when they were messing up being parents. And then you, you sort of, each step of the way, you forgive them because you realize, wow, I, had, I have no clue what I'm doing. No wonder, <laughs> no wonder they did that. So my dad uh, would be one. Yeah, uh, two more. I'd love to, like, I'd love to, we'd have a language barrier, but I'd love to meet with someone like Socrates, mm. right? Uh, just to, to get that and uh, to get that perspective on thinking itself. Who else would I, I do you know what? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be lazy for speed. Re I've always wanted to meet Richard Bach. He's still out there, but he won't meet anybody. In fact, at one point he invited me to direct the film adaptation of Illusions. He and I were exchanging emails and um, Rob Legato, who just won the Oscar for the visual effects in uh, The Jungle Book, he offered to do the VFX because the VFX have to be phenomenal. If you read the book, you'll see why. Mm, the VFX yeah. have to be totally believable and real. Um, but I just couldn't pull the money together quickly enough and he's given it back to uh, somebody else, the rights back. But oh. Richard, I, I have such such respect for him as an author and he had such impact on my life um, that would be it would just be great to shake his hand and, and say hey perfect now you're on the plane on the way back having had your year in tokyo i hope you enjoyed it lots of ramen itchy <laughs> ran ramen i'm yeah. having some in like three weeks <laughs> <laughs> um and the restriction to classical music has been lifted so oh. what's the first piece of music you'd want to hear on the plane on the way home <laughs> I think after a year of classical music, it'd probably be some, well, I, I obviously I should say Vinci, that's uh, Samantha, my partner's music. Obviously that would be my first choice in case she's listening. Yes, especially <laughs> as she wasn't invited to the lunch. Yeah, <laughs> she'd, she'd be rather disappointed. <laughs> yeah, that's true, don't, <laughs> shh, don't tell her. Um, I'll have lunch with her tomorrow. 
Yeah. Uh, it, after a year of it would probably be something very different like rage against the machine or something like when i'm at the gym and you know rage against the machine are phenomenal yeah. something like that um my my musical tastes are extremely diverse so uh something to to counterbalance the classical music i reckon that's you done wow that's, i hope you enjoyed your year um we i often like to do the this or that game as well but um um you've been predictably and beautifully verbose so thank you for that <laughs> we'll do the this or that game on another occasion i'll ask you one of them though yeah. um see the future or change the past <laughs> see the future or change the past i uh, see the future Nice. It's got the lottery tickets in it, I guess, so which helps. Well, also, you know, I'm a futurist, literally. It's my job to forecast yeah. what I'm like and be as accurate as possible. Yeah. And I think that uh, an old psychologist friend of mine used to say, we do not regret what we do. We regret what we don't do. Yeah. What we do becomes who we are. And in a very literal sense, very meaningful sense, we are our narrative. We are our story. We are a story. Mm. for ourselves and for others in different ways and i think you know it's different versions of that concept and i think that if you were to change the past then who would you be yeah better to better to go with kismet and let the past be what it is and enjoy the vision of the future but of course changing viewing the future means you have the potential to change the past for that future Yes, or the, the, future, both. the future, the future's future. Yeah. yeah, Maxine, thank you so much for doing this. This has oh. been a delight. I hope you enjoyed it. Likewise, yeah. thank you very much. Good no, it's my pleasure. We should have a longer conversation because there's so much more to explore. Um, yes. But this will go to our YouTube channel and our SoundCloud channel, a profile on the Great. website, and then lots of promotion both via LinkedIn. But uh, don't rush off. But for the time being. To, um, Thank you so much for doing this. Um, may, may I finish with a dad joke? Since I'm a fan yes. of dad jokes. So my favorite dad, my favorite, I do a lot of keynotes and I like to throw them in. They're yeah. awful. My, my favorite dad joke at the moment is how many tickles does it take to tickle an octopus? And the answer, of course, is tentacles. <laughs> there you go. I love that. Oh, there's a book in that and a, and a, and a podcast. That's brilliant. I love it. Maxim, thank you so much. It's very kind of you to be a full member and for joining me today. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for having me.